Hey guys, um, do you guys want to drop your emails in the chat so I can start a chain? And then for some of the judges, I know you have your emails in your paradigm. So I'll just use that one unless you prefer otherwise. All right, I just sent it. Let me know when you get it. And then um, if y'all are good to go, we are as well. This is one of your judges just letting you know that I am not ready to go yet. And I won't be at least for another five minutes. This round doesn't start till quarter or half after. Is that right? Yes, that is right. Yeah. So. So, yeah, just letting you guys know that I, I'm not quite ready, but I will be, obviously, in time. Okay, awesome.
Yes. We about ready, everybody. My partner's just using the restroom. He'll be here soon. Okay, cool. Did you send out the email for the chain? Because I haven't gotten it. Um, I did send it out. Um, has anyone else gotten it? OK. Uh, do you want to confirm your email for me, just in case I copy paste it wrong? Sure, yeah. It's 23lakmeh at hawken.edu. That is what I sent it to. That's really weird. Um, yeah, that's the same problem for me. So it's probably something with like the, you know, the school's email. Okay. Do you guys have personals that you could use? It might work yeah, if sure. we make the email chain. This happened in a round before as well. Okay. Um, we'll just put our emails in the chat then.
All right, I only have, so like, was there a judge email that I'm missing or? Um, I had put, sorry, I didn't retype mine in the. I don't care to be in the email chain. I'm probably not gonna look at it anyways. All right, that's There fine. you go, there's your answer. Sent the email. I just got it. All right, just let me know when it runs good. All right, let me get a timer out and open the case. Okay, so yeah, everyone's good? Mm -hmm. Cool. We negate contention one is poverty. The IMF increases poverty in the poorest nations through austerity. In order to ensure its loans are paid back, the IMF forces recipient countries to pursue a prescription of fiscal austerity. They have only doubled down on such programs in the COVID era. According to Ambrose 20 of Open Democracy, virtually every country receiving an IMF emergency loan has a section stating the government remain fully committed to austerity programs during what would otherwise be the country's economic recovery period. Indeed, Oxfam 20 quantifies that 83% of loans given in the past year included aggressive austerity programs, slashing public sector budgets, and cutting vital anti-poverty programs. Absent the IMF regulation, because social spending is so politically popular, these cuts would never happen. In a study of over 100 countries, Laura O9 of the Intra-African Bank finds that social expenditures are shielded from the adverse effects of the debt burden. Contention two is deregulation. According to Stiglitz 17 of Columbia University, most of the advanced industrial countries like the US and Japan built up their economies by wisely and selectively protecting some of their industries. However, the IMF foreclosed this opportunity by pursuing an aggressive agenda of deregulation. Stiglitz explains that as a condition of its loans, the IMF requires that countries rapidly privatize and liberalize their economies before building up the necessary financial infrastructure and regulation. Empowered by these policies, removing capital controls and protections to domestic industry, Western investors are able to plunder emerging markets. Engdahl 05 of Princeton explains, this allows high profile speculators to come into a country, run up asset prices, take huge profits and quickly sell, then exit with huge gains as the local economy collapses behind them. Such speculative bubbles inevitably burst with serious consequences. According to Baker 10 of Northeastern University, IMF liberalization has led repeatedly to speculative bubbles with a temporary influx of capital, followed inevitably by currency and market crashes. Historically, Blue Steen 05 of public affairs finds this led to financial crises in Thailand, Indonesia, South Korea, Russia, and Brazil. The impact is financial crises. When Argentina faced a similar crisis fueled by IMF-induced speculation, Hernandez 11 writes that Argentina's GDP shrank by 10% and nearly three quarters of the population were estimated to be living under the poverty line. Contention three is the environment. The IMF hurts the environment in two ways. First is fossil fuel investment. Ferran 20 finds that while the IMF outwardly endorses clean energy initiatives, their economic advice speaks to the contrary, actively encouraging increased funding for coal power plants and backing tax cuts for high carbon projects. Indeed, Ferran continues that five countries have recently been advised by the IMF have experienced ongoing coal expansion. TOG21 writes that fossil fuel pollution is killing 8.7 million people a year, doubling from previous estimates. Second is deforestation. WRMO2 finds that IMF loans necessitate structural adjustment programs or SAPs which aim to promote privatization at the expense of other programs leading to budget cuts that have impeded environmental programs and inadequate funding for environmental regulatory agencies. That's why WRM concludes that the IMF policies have caused extensive deforestation in countries in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. IMF policies are uniquely worse because Bethiko 2 finds that unlike private sources of debt, IMF debt cannot be rescheduled, compelling people to overexploit natural resources for short-term gains. For example, Zogby 5 writes that the IMF reduced taxes on exports of forest products in Cameroon to increase revenue, leading to over 75% of the country's forests being logged. Welch 98 explains that SAPs also aim to decrease government deficits at the expense of creating sustainable economic growth, resulting in strict austerity measures that gut social spending, increase income inequality, and destroy local industries. Dibby 2000 finds that IMF mismanagement created financial crises in Indonesia, South Korea, and Thailand, creating deep depressions that pushed 200 million people into poverty. 
empirically Vreeland 01 finds that IMF participating countries had an average rate of deforestation of 0.91% of GDP compared to 0.37% of GDP for comparable non-member countries. Protecting the world's forests is critical because the African Climate Reporters 18 write that 1.6 billion of the world's poor derive their income, food, and medical needs directly from the forest. Thus, we negate it. Cool. Before we start, Catherine, do you need to see me, Evelyn? Good morning. Uh, can I see the evidence that 1.6 billion people rely on the forest? Is that all? Uh, can I also see on your C1 the examples that you provided? All right. And then... Uh, that's it for me. Peppa? Um, what's the tag on the 200 million poverty evidence? All right, let me go see. It's... Uh, IMF as management created financial crises. Or like, sorry, the author name and the date. It's DB2000. Okay, can I see the evidence? Yep. Thank you. Real quick, on the evidence about like the examples, we didn't read any specific examples on our C1. Did you mean for our C2? No, I meant for your C1. You said that's empirically what happened in Thailand. That was on our C2. Uh, is that the one about, uh, basically it's the one about like privatization? Yeah, that's our C2. Oh, my bad. Okay. I sent all of them. Awesome. When I get it, I'm good to start. All right, it looks like it's there. Are we ready to start? Um, I've not gotten the email yet, but it's probably just my Wi-Fi, so I'm just going to reload one more time. Okay, I just got it. Everyone good? Awesome. We affirm contention one is unloading the gun. Food insecurity is a crisis as deadly as a gun to the head as the World Food Program finds that every five seconds a child dies due to food insecurity. Unfortunately, Delay 19 explains that due to the conflicting interests of political leaders, individual countries have no plan to address food insecurity until 2030. Luckily, the IMF has been solving this crisis in two ways. The first is direct aid. According to the New Humanitarian, the IMF is increasing its food security targeted aid, especially to developing countries. Critically, the IMF recognizes urgency, approving plans of immediate aid to Haiti of $38.7 million, among many other developing countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. Dow 19 finds, in a global study spanning 25 years, that the IMF specifically targets food and agriculture in 80% of the countries it helps, through boosting private farming and supporting agricultural trade. Castell 21 collaborates that such trade measures have empirically decreased food prices. For instance, Oxfam 17 writes that the IMF has been aiding Malawi, which suffers from an extreme food crisis since 2012 and has funded programs that increase food production, feeding up to 1 million people. The second is reform. 
Red 16 reports that the IMF studies tax reforms using a diagnostic tool and streamlines them to ensure that more money is collected from the wealthy and that revenue goes into government, government social spending. Brad quantifies that the IMF has completed such tax reforms in 120 countries, including El Salvador, where it led to a $160 million increase in social spending. This aid has yielded results, as the New York Times in 2015 finds that 200 million people have been lifted out of starvation in the last 30 years. Contention two is relief. Gutner 20 writes that the IMF is the go-to financial institution for most countries in times of economic crisis, and it is again today. The COVID-19 pandemic has driven countries to turn to the fund for emergency financing and advice on how to stabilize their economies. Due to the economic dangers of the pandemic recession, Rowden 20 affirms that IMF bailouts are necessary to prevent the developing world from collapse, and a $1 trillion reserve like the one the IMF is mobilized to deploy is key to stabilizing global economies. In fact, Reuters 20 reports that just one month after the pandemic began, the IMF began dispersing financial assistance to countries like Kyrgyzstan, Honduras, and Rwanda. So far, the Washington Post in 2020 reports that the IMF has provided more than $100 billion in emergency financing to 85 countries in need through, develop, through doubling access to their rapid credit facility. Autumn 20 writes that loans through this facility are provided with minimal to zero conditionalities and a 0% interest rate. These loans enable further economic growth, as Bradlow 20 finds that investors interpret the IMF's loans as an expression of stability and support, giving them the confidence to invest in countries' debt themselves. Beyond giving loans, Summers 20 finds that the IMF has forgiven debt service payments for the poorest countries, and Reuters 20 notes that at the IMF's urging, world leaders have suspended debt payments for much of the developing world. This trend is empirical, as the UACC 20 quantifies that members have benefited from the IMF's rapid credit line 29 times during crises, including Mozambique to recover from Cyclone Adai and Guinea and Liberia to confront the Ebola outbreak. As a result, the CDC reports that Ebola in these two countries was able to be contained in less than two months. The impact is lives. Tree 20 writes that by forgiving debt and offering loans, the IMF has enabled countries' resources to go to pandem pandemic containment rather than debt servicing. Deb 20 finds that without the containment measures implemented, we would have seen two to 10 times more COVID deaths globally, meaning we've avoided three to 27 million deaths. Thus, we are proud to affirm. All right, I just want two pieces of evidence. Um, okay. Shoot, I forgot the first one. I, I bet I'll think of it. But the one I really want was the um, two to 10 times less COVID deaths. And then let me just take a second. Uh, all right, I'm forgetting. I'm sure Mayhol wants a piece of evidence. Maybe I can think of it. Uh, can I just have the Malawi card? And then also, that's it. Yeah, just the Malawi card. Oh, yeah. Uh, also, the Ebola card. That's what I wanted. Whatever says that the IMF was like able to stop Ebola in two months. Yes. Okay, it should, the first three should be sent and then I'm having some copy pasting issues. So the last one should be sent in a different email. All right, I'll tell you when I get that. Awesome.
All right, looks like it's there. Do we have it? Yep, I just got it. So yep. I'll just All show right. those going across. You good for All right, let's roll. Uh, can I have first question? Yes, go for it. All right, start the time now. On your first point about aid, what kind of aid does the IMF give? So there's several different types of aid, as we tell you in our case, right? The first type of aid is like literally just directly giving them money. For example, in Haiti, there was a big food security issue, which is why sure. the IMF directly funded like private farming yeah. and things like that. But second, right. there's a lot of different facilities that the IMF right. uses to give aid, right? There's the Poverty right. Growth and Reduction Trust that comes yeah. with really low interest. Sure. And there's, yeah. No, no, what I'm asking is like, what kind, is it like humanitarian aid? Are they literally giving food or is it loans? So the IMF is not a developmental institution, which means it's not its role to give developmental or humanitarian aid directly. Right. What it can do is give the government money and make sure that the government is spending that in social spending, which is right. what it's done in all these countries. You can have a question. Awesome. On your first contention about austerity, mm -hmm. most of the countries that have been getting aid recently from the IMF, what specific facility or credit line have they been using to get this money? I'm guessing you can tell me. Yeah, it's called the rapid credit facility. Do you know okay. what the interest rate or the number of conditionalities is that comes with e each loan through this facility? No. Okay, it's one conditionality and it's that the government has to write a letter of intent saying what their plans are. Okay, so in how so much money has been given from RPC? Like a hundred billion dollars. A hundred billion? In, how long has that in, been? That's just in COVID. And then 29 just times prior as well. Just in COVID, there's been a hundred billion dollars? All right. Yeah, that's uh, how much the IMF has given out in sure. aid, but you can go get a question. Wait, so is all aid from this program? Yeah, the vast majority is because essentially COVID is classified as something that requires rapid and like immediate responses, which is why most of the aid that's going to countries right, right now is through okay. the rapid credit facility or the sure. emergency response facility. All right, can I have a question? Can I have a question. Yeah, go for cool. it. Cool. Um, on debt relief, so is your CDC evidence, okay, first off, is your impact just math? No, our impact is saying that we've avoided. No, no, but like, did you do math? I know the two to 10 times more thing, but did you just multiply that, that by like the number of worldwide cases? We would have avoided two, to, we would have had two to 10 times more deaths than the three million that we've had. So it's not really math. It's just. Okay, no, no, but this like, did you multiply two things together rather than it being in a piece of evidence? Sure. Yeah, you okay. can, you can okay. make that response. Yeah. In rebuttal. Um, you can have a question. Okay, um, let's talk about your thing about Cameroon. Mm -hmm. What percent of Cameroon's forests were logged before the IMF was involved? I don't know, but definitely not 75%. Does Cameroon rely heavily on exports before the IMF was involved? No, they, they weren't. No. Cameroon was an extremely export-oriented country. All these low-income okay. countries are super oriented towards exports because they have a lot of natural resources okay. like their forests. Okay. So how do you know that this, like, logging was a result of the IMF and not just sure, the country sure, logging more as sure. a result of the past. One, one, the evidence is specific that it's because of the IMF, but two, okay. we have the other piece of evidence. I forgot the name. I think, I, I think it's Vreeland, I think. Yeah, but we also have that evidence that says the rates of harvesting natural resources increase under the IMF because these countries have to pay back their debt to the IMF. Okay, that's time. All right, May hold. do you want to run a prep? We can take a little. All right, sweet. I'll start running prep right now. All right, that was like 18 seconds. All right. Sweet. It's just going to be straight down the case. Cool. Is anyone not ready? I missed the roadmap. Just write down uh, the pro. Pro. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Is anyone not? Good.
on scene, on unloading the gun. They say food is going to get a lot better, but they're completely wrong for two reasons. First is Sandra Tan, who writes that the IMF has forced many nations to eliminate subsidies for food, pesticides, and fertilizers, which is why farmers can't turn a profit anymore. This is because Sandra continues that in Zambia, where the IMF required the government to eliminate subsidies, like they say is being good, prices skyrocketed and farmers were forced to turn their fields because they literally couldn't make money. But second is deregulation. Sonkin 20 writes that when the IMF plays a pivotal role in facilitating market-led land reforms, like they say is good, it's not actually good for those countries because private investors access large land scale deals that they can just like take over developing countries land and produce crops that aren't good for that country but rather Western development countries, which is why Global Exchange 11 writes that nearly 80% of all malnourished children in the developing world live in countries where farmers have been forced to shift from localized food consumption products that just export to wealthy countries, which is why Mariano finds that last year an estimated 124 million people were in crisis level hunger because the IMF has facilitated, enabled, and led the global rush for land grabs. The historical precedence is literally given by them. They would tell you that in Malawi it got a whole lot better after the IMF came in, but that's not true. For example, in 2002, the Garut evidence finds that the IMF caused the famine in Malawi. The IMF had the uh, encouraged the to write that because of the privatization that that uh, government agency had to force like commercial loans, which made their debt go up a ton, which is why the IMF advised them to sell all of their grain reserves in 02, which led to the famine that year, which massively outweighs because instead of 1 million people needing food assistance, 30% of the population needed it in that country. But then they say the IMF was the reason like people were being fed. But no, if you look it up, it, it was the World Food Agency, which is because the IMF does not give out humanitarian aid. There's no evidence saying that. Let's go to the next reform. They say it got a lot better, but their own evidence on El Salvador just mentions the IMF then lists four other agencies that do exactly the same thing, which is why the evidence they talk about and the reason El Salvador, El Salvador changed was because the U.S. aid government gave developmental assistance and not because of the IMF, and they don't say that anywhere in their evidence. But also, their impact is a joke. It just lists all of the people in hungry and, and hunger before like 1990 or at 1990 and then up to 2020. There's literally not the word IMF in the entire card, which is why on to their next point on relief. They say it gets a lot better, but Kuru 16 writes that first workers are only contracted on a part-time basis when they're getting things like developmental and default aid because delays in the implementation of processes and projects are necessitated because the aid is just unpredictable. No one knows when it comes, which is why Carlos and Nicholas finds that any, uh, in like the long-term processes, there's no long-term investment increase and it goes through a bureauc bureaucratic process, which means that the aid is just useless in the long run. But second, the IMF-based aid just freezes public sector, sector hiring because basic social services are given to private private businesses who spike the prices so they can't hire anyone and also the poor in the country can't afford social services. Then they say it's been given to 28 countries, but go to the IMF website. That's only a billion dollars relief. That's absolutely nothing. Turn their argument. Shaw 13 writes that because nations that take IMF loans on net are told to peg their currency to the dollar when the IMF donors have the exchange rates in their favor. Julian, we lost you there for a second. The 67 countries are literally just repeat customers of the IMF on RCFs. They say it gets a lot better, but once again, go to the IMF website. The IMF itself writes that the RCFs are limited to an 80% of the yearly quota from every single country. So that means at best, they're just getting four fifths of what they already had. But then their own evidence says that the RCF pool is limited to $10 billion. The hundred billion is not in RCFs, but then their impact is also bad because they talk about COVID and Ebola, but the Ebola evidence doesn't say IMF anywhere because there's no comparative given. And on COVID more vitally, it's just an analysis of what New Zealand did. It literally has nothing to do with MEF at all. Also, the IMF did not give loans to every country, so they can't go global deaths. Obviously, the U.S. has the most deaths, and the IMF did not give them a loan. All right. Um, you cut out a little bit there. For me, I'm not sure if it was for everyone else, but could you send a doc, if you have one, for your responses to C2 and your uh, first couple of ones yeah. for C1? Thanks. Okay. Do you want my first responses for C1 and then all C2? Yeah, that'd be awesome.
Are we sending a speech doc or, or what's going on here? All right, I just put everything into a Google Doc so I can just drop it in the chat if you want. Thank you. All right. Tell me if there's any like access problems to it. For sure. I think that should be all. Yeah, it says I need access. All right. Um, Try switching the link setting to anyone on the internet can view. Okay, yeah, I see that. Here, I don't wait. I don't think I can do that because of my um, you know, my school. So I'm just gonna drop it into an email. Is that fine? Yes, please. Let's keep it moving. All right, I sent everything in an email. Okay, when I get it, we'll start prep. Does your speech doc have the cards in it? I can drop those if you want. Yeah, can I see Shaw 13? Yep. And then, uh, yeah, I'll, because I didn't hear some of the stuff on your C2, so I'll just wait until I get the speech doc. Okay, I just got the speech doc. Oh, uh, do I have to request access or can you share? Do you email? I dropped it in an email, yeah. Oh, gosh. Okay. And I'm just getting Shaw. Okay, we'll start prep. Catherine, you got the email, right? Yeah. Um, okay. Can I get the... Yeah. Oh, you sent the card. You sent the card. We'll start yeah, prep. it's time to start prep, y'all. Okay, I'm The order of my speech is going to be um, our case, their case, and um, I don't go too fast, but then sometimes I get like excited and then I start like getting faster. So just let me know if like at any time you need me to stop. Just yell clear. Okay. Oh, actually, it's going to be a brief overview, but the overview is kind of just an extension of our case, just on our case, you can pull it out. 
officer at the top. Article 26 tells you that any member of the IMF may withdraw from the fund at any time by transmitting a notice, and that will be active on the day that it's submitted. Despite anything they say, the IMF is literally an option. If it was really that bad, countries could leave whenever they want. Let's start on our case. One, we tell you that privatization empirically lifted 1.5 million people out of poverty because the developing country has more fertile land and better crops. Virgin Tech explains that they just need a bigger market. Deregulation has empirically ha happened as they drop Castell, which tells you that food prices on net go down, and there's more accessibility, which lifts 200 million people out of poverty. They This directly responds to their second kind of contention about deregulation, since it empirically has helped people. But then they just say that the IMF forced countries to eliminate subsidize. Literally 92% of the countries didn't have to cut subsidize on net. It's better. On Malawi, they just say that the World Food Organization helped. There's no evidence for this whatsoever. We would say that the IMF is the only one that can do this because they have the most resources, and fundamentally, they've already done this before. But then on our impact, right, we would say, again, the IMF is the largest organization that can give food aid to begin with, which means that even though there are four other organizations that are helping them, they're minuscule at best, and they don't come with conditionalities. So if they really didn't want the, if they really could do it themselves, then they wouldn't take from the IMF at all, but empirically, they have to take from the IMF, which has helped them. But then their evidence about 124 million is so bad. It literally just says that 124 million people are in hunger, not that the IMF put them in hunger. But then on C2, right, we would say that they're a project, well, they say that they're project delays, but Hayashima 808 finds that the IMF encourages trade the second that it gets in, which means that just decreases poverty. In the last 30 years, the average income of the poor segment of the population has increased across all countries and income groups. But then their Shaw 13 card is even worse. It just says, F it says that we're using SAPs, which is so outdated as Inquirer 14 tells you that we had no longer started using SAT. But then their quota thing makes no sense. You don't get assistance, every, you don't get 100% assistance every single year. We say that 100 billion has already happened. But then let's go to their case. Their Oxfam evidence is literally so bad. You should click into the data scene and you see on net spending goes up. They just cherry pick the places that spending should go down. But then austerity measures empirically have like boosts and stuff. That's why Muslim 14 finds that the long term IMF support has helped low income countries sustain economic growth. But then it's uh, they say that it's unpopular to cut spending. This makes no sense. Empirically, countries without IMF assistance still have to do fiscal tightening. When you're broke, you literally have to cut down spending. But then we've been reforming through the decade as King 16 finds that the average number of conditionalities by the IMF has dropped 25%. COVID is a really good example of this happening as now they lend through the RCF, which literally has zero conditionalities to begin with, except for the letter of intent. But then their 200 million card is also really bad. It says from, it's from 2000 and it says that it's because of conditionalities, which is decreasing in the status quo. So we would argue on net, it's still getting better. But then for liberalization, for farmers explicitly, we would say that this is already good because they just need a car, uh, they just need a market anyways. But then trade liberalization is also good as could borrow 15 of the UN finds that the global annual welfare gains from the trade liberalization are up to $200 billion in developing countries and two thirds help these countries. But then this could lift 140 million people out of poverty and it has already done that. But then liberalizing economy also might have short term adjustment costs that they're talking about, but it leads to long term economic growth because you're lowering the cost of goods and offering a market for domestic goods. But then on climate, first of all, it's about SAPs. And again, I quote 14 says that the IMF has changed and no longer imposes structural adjustment programs. But then in 2019, the IAO approached that the, um, the IMF already started a huge sustainable plan. This is in the status quo. But then the IMF makes countries implement a carbon tax, which is really good because it's the best way to long term combat climate change. But then quarter of 19 finds that the IMF reduces energy consumption in developing countries. But then they say that we must deforce because debt has to be repaid. But this is untrue. As Donner 20 finds that the IMF has forgiven loans for the 30 poorest countries, means that there are no more conditionalities for the countries that need it the most. But then on logging, we would say that Cam Cam Cameroon was always an export oriented country, which means that they would have to log research either way. But then the most important thing is Bird 20, which explains that their studies are really bad because IMF programs are always implemented in recessions that have short term poverty either way. Their studies don't look at the long term. Bird, after ex examining everything in 50 countries over 25 years, finds that overall IMF involvement increases income inequality by 18%, increases the income of the bottom 25% by 40%, and increases the poverty gap, decreases the poverty gap by 40%. This implicates two things. One, if people don't need money to log in the first place after the IMF, per their logic, logging would become more extreme in their world. But then two, the IMF is actually helping the energy bill being eco-friendly. If you're voting for environment, you're voting out. Are you for cross? Really quickly, I cut off after um, IMF carbon tax, and then I got back on like Cameroon was export oriented. Was there a response in between those? Uh, yeah, it was all about environment stuff. Can you just like give me a quick overview of what it was? Yeah, so uh, first thing I said, was uh, no more SAPs after 2014. And then I talked about the IEA sustainable plan from 2019. And yeah. then IMF reduces energy consumption, which is really good. And then IMF's forgiving debt, so there's no more debt dependency. But then Cameroon's an export oriented country, so they would log anyways. Okay, yeah, sweet. All right, real quick, can I see two cards? Can I see the carbon tax card? And then there's no more SAPs. I'll send the no more SAPs card. Peppa, do you want to? Yeah, I got you.
Do y'all want IMF is doing carbon tax or that carbon tax is good? Doing carbon tax. Yeah. Okay, that is set. All right, cool. When we get that, we can start cross. Okay. The um, evidence about SAPs is also set. Okay, it looks like they're there. Can we start cross? Oh yeah, okay, I just got it. Yeah. Okay. Everyone's good? Mm -hmm. Sweet. Then, uh, can I have first question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just start the time now. All right, so let's talk really quickly about four of your responses. You say that SAPs are going away. You say a lot about how right now it's changing. So is the topic that we should look at the future of the IMF or on balance, the past right, included? So a couple of things, right? Now we would say that it's on balance, but we would also say that the card that we read is that conditionality has been decreasing since like 2012. But also sure. we would say that like, even though it's unbalanced, we have to evaluate now, right? Because now is everything going into the future. Now is like everything for the next 1000 years. Right. So we have well, to balance what's happening right now and who we can save right now. All right. So you're saying infinite time frame, any future impact, basically. Well, we're saying that, like, we have to evaluate both, but also. All right. Yeah, that's our infinite. argument. Sweet. Can I get a question? Yeah. 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 So <laughs> on your so you tell me about how, like, the, there's like deforestation, right? Yep. So for this, like, deforestation impact empirically, what has this done? What do you mean by that? To the country. Like what, what has this done to the country? Okay, deforestation has increased three times. Okay. And then? And then we give the example of Thailand, South Korea, Indonesia, 200 million people so in poverty. So what's the impact? 200 million people in poverty. Okay, why? Because they now have an extractive industry instead of building Wait, 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 wait. was that your 1.6 billion about how people in the world no, that's rely? A one. That's a different argument. Huh? We have two impacts off of deforestation. The first is poverty from Thailand, South Korea, and Indonesia. Okay, so why is there poverty? Why is there poverty? Because the investment in the country goes to extractive industries that don't hire enough people. One, two, long-term economic- But if they're export-oriented countries either way, they always have to export. Cameroon right, is South Korea ex exporting crops. Yeah, I get that Cameroon is export-oriented. Is South Korea ex When did South Korea log? Uh, 19, like 90, okay, the recession we're talking about is 97, 98. Oh, so it's the Asian financial crisis? Not necessarily, well, it's part of that. Our argument okay, is linking into- it's part into, of that. Yeah, well, that's the time frame of it. It's right okay, when okay, the Asian let's talk about the started. Asian financial crisis. I mean, right? you don't make this as a response, but okay. Okay, I'm just trying to clear up your argument because Korea is like 99%, 90% of its industry is from Intel and Samsung. Okay. So where is this defor? Why do they need deforestation in the first place if they're making? I mean, okay, their you're saying Samsung. Tech? When was the tech boom? Right, like, sure. Right now, they might have a lot of tech industries because. So you're saying now under. there's no more deforestation, even though the IMF still. No, won. we're saying that the IMF, when they gave loans, boosted deforestation, which caused the recession. I mean, but we don't now have is there to any argue. More deforestation? We don't have to argue that. Uh, I would argue that it's really important. Just, just can you why? answer my question? I don't know is the answer to that question because we don't think it's important for our case because we link into past impacts mostly for 100% probability. Sure, that's fine. All right, sweet. So we ran like 18 seconds of prep, so I'll just start running a good portion of that now.
All right. I think that was all our prep. Uh, let me just get the timer out. Okay, I'll go down our case, then their case. <clears throat> uh, is everyone good? Actually, I'll go their overview, our case, then back to their case. So everyone's good now? Yeah? Okay. Start on their overview. They say that like countries can just drop out of the IMF, like advising them whenever they want. Yeah, but they're going to lose the loans that the IMF give. when the gives. When the IMF is dangling like $100 billion in front of them, they're always going to want that and not just leave. Go to our case. We'll collapse on our contention three about the environment. First on fossil fuel investment, this just goes completely conceited. They don't give you a single response to this. Ferran 20 explains that IMF encourages coal expansion, which is why historically we've seen five countries expand their coal industries because of IMF advice. That's really crucial because the Tong 21 evidence, which goes conceited, explains that 8.7 million people a year die from fossil fuel investments. But more importantly, go to deforestation. WRN02 explains that the IMF uses structural adjustment programs and there's no money for the government because of that and they have to cut like environmental programs. That's really bad because when the IMF wants its debt back, the government has to go in and extract more natural resources, which is really bad because one, the 200 million impact was conceded out of rebuttal from Dibio 2000 that explains that because of this 200 million people go into poverty, we've seen it historically happen in like Thailand and South Korea. But also the Vreeland 01 evidence explains that the rates of deforestation in these other countries increase by like three times. And that's important because 1.6 billion people need the forests to live. On their responses, first they say there's no more structural adjustment programs. First, their like idea of looking at infinite time frame makes absolutely no sense. We don't know when the world is going to end. You're also going to prefer our past impacts about 200 million because the resolution is on balance. But more importantly, you're going to vote off the 200 million impact because that is straight conceded out of rebuttal, and they have no response to it whatsoever. It outweighs on scope. Go to their case. On aid, they drop the response that Julian makes that the IMF forces far farmers to have like no more profit because their land is a lot worse. And that's really bad because uh, the farmers like lose land and then there's no more food. But more importantly, on deregulation, we tell you private investors go in and make the area useful for cash crops rather than food that's beneficial for the country, which is why 80% of malnourished children live in those countries. They respond that like it already happened. That doesn't respond to the point about cash crops because cash crops are like really like cash crops prevent the people in the country from getting any benefit from like their economy and whatever because private investors just want to help themselves for like profit but then they drop every single indict julian does on their case first their own evidence says that there's four other actors doing this other than the imf clearly they have no unique uniqueness but then they say about the world food agency doing it they just say we have no evidence one it's their own evidence but two they, we have the historical precedent on that but three i could name like another like unicef probably gives food as well then uh, go to, also they drop the guru evidence that says the IMF actually caused the famine in Malawi. Then go to debt relief. What's really important here is on the RCS point, they just say no to the quota point. The quota point is that they can only get back like four fifths of what they put in. So they're not really getting anything. But then they also drop the response that like out of the 29 countries they lift, listed, they only got like uh, $1 billion in re relief, which is really, really small. But then on their impact, really crucially, again, it's just some math and their impact is about New Zealand evidence. You're always voting for us on the scope and strength of link and clarity. Okay, we're going to take some prep. Starting.
All right, the order is going to be our case, their case. Everyone good? Awesome. And we're going to switch it up and do the overview on their case this time. All right. Let's start on our first contention about food insecurity. What we tell you is that the IMF specifically funds food production and expands trade, all of which brings prices down. But then they completely drop the second link, which is that the IMF streamlines taxes to make sure more money is collected from the wealthy and that this goes into social spending. They've literally done this in 120 countries. They have like one response. And then that like leads to like 200 million people that have been listed out of starvation. They have like one response on the second link. The first thing they say is the developing countries like farmers are getting poorer, they're getting bankrupt. First, we would say the only reason why trade lib works really well is because developing countries have more fertile land, which means when you open up trade, they have a bigger market, which is why farmers have empirically gotten richer. They dropped the evidence that Catherine reads about this. But then we would say empirically, trade lib has lifted 140 million out of poverty. They dropped this evidence as well. But then on Malawi, we would say that Malawi, their example is so outdated. We would say insofar as recently, the IMF has been feeding 1.5 million people and it's active in 80% of the countries in the world. That's always going to outweigh on magnitude. On their like alt Actors like thing that they're trying to do. Catherine gives you two responses. First, the World Food, A Food Agency and like USAID and UNICEF and all these new responses they're making in summary literally just monitor like food insecurity and they don't actually solve for it. We would say the IMF is the best one to solve for it because it literally has four times the resources of these other countries. But then finally, they say that like, de but then deregulation is kind of just a case across that. But at the end of the day, they say our evidence lists four other agencies. No, it doesn't. They didn't even call for this evidence. How do they know? We would say our evidence is literally talking about the IMF being active in 80% of countries, group all the responses. They drop Castell, which wins us the round because it tells you that prices are going down, more people can access food. But even then, Children 17 tells you that kids who grow up without enough food are more likely to have malnourished or unhealthy children, which makes food insecurity a cyclical issue that's just going to keep on going without the IMF. We went on time frame there. But then let's go to COVID. We would we'll concede that it's like not enough and that like countries aren't really being helped that much. But then let's go to their case. We would say they just say on like the overview, they just say like the, every single country just like needs the money. But then we would say there's a lot of other banks in the world that have money. These countries have been getting loans for decades. If they thought what's happening to them is that bad, they just go to other banks. They haven't. That means the whole entire world does the weighing for you and tells you that they would rather stay in the IMF with all the side effects that it has than leave. But then they drop a couple of things on austerity. The first thing they drop is that SAPs are no longer even happening, which means their impact is so outdated. But then they also drop the thing that, Ka like Catherine says in Crossfire, which is that the resolution is not on balance. The resolution is resolved. The benefits of the IMF outweigh the harms. That literally means that we should like value future lives as well as current ones. But then they drop Bird 20, which loses them the round. We tell you in the most comprehensive study yet, the IMF reduces income inequality by 18% and decreases the poverty gap by 40%. The warrant is that the IMF, like its programs increase spending, which is why their studies don't look at the long term they just look at the short term at that point we would say that that prereqs their case because it decreases the need to be exports oriented and rely on cheap fuels so because like now the poor have more money but then they also lose the run when they drop carbon tax don't let them make new responses to this we that means that we're long term solving for climate change the carbon tax is the only way to start for climate change in the long term their 200 million impact is the asian financial crisis that was a currency level not the imf vote out all right ready for cross yeah let me get my timer and then i'll be good You guys want first, so go ahead and take the first question. All right. So let's talk about your response to the World Food Agency, right? You say that they're too poor and they just give surveillance. What happened in Malawi? Who gave the food? Who's actually feeding those people? So Malawi has been suffering from a food crisis for a variety of reasons, right? We didn't expand on this earlier, but I can explain it now. No, Basically, yeah, I get that. There was a refugee I... crisis in Malawi, right? There were a lot of cyclones Ooh. nearby. They had a I... lot of natural disasters that they were suffering yeah, from, yeah. which is why they were in a food crisis. The IMF came in in 2012 and started feeding them. The World no. Food Organization, our impact evidence actually says the World Food Agency actually just monitors the number of people that are in food insecurity doesn't actually right. fall back so the it. problem is you just say that to our response but we read you the evidence that says that the world food agency literally is the one who went into malawi and fed the people you're just reading that people were fed and the imf was there our evidence is telling you who was actually doing the feeding? Our right? evidence is really clear. It says that the IMF went into Malawi. It reformed their program that was really, really bad and really wasteful. And that made it so that the okay. people who actually needed the help got more food and yeah, got yeah. more aid. Which program? Um, I can tell you the exact name. Hold on. The Farm Input Subsidy Program.
The IMF okay, report. So the one that they reformed in 2002 that's the evidence that caused that the 2002 it. recession. What? There was no recession in 2002. The, the there literally was, was right? right? They the lost food insecurity crisis. 30% then, of the country was food insecure in 2002 in Malawi because of IMF currency exchanges. Oh, wait, hold on. Malawi like the, was suffering from food insecurity because one, there were natural disasters. Right. Two, it was a really poor country from literally the beginning of time. Sure. And three, it didn't have really strong international relations. So it didn't. Yeah, and really I don't hear this response in any country. speech. What? You're just bringing this up in crossfire, right? In That's reality, fine. We're not going to extend it, but I'm just telling you what you're saying doesn't make sense. Yeah, we're, we're saying that the IMF came argument. in 2012 and is the reason why people are being pulled out. Yeah, of and we're weighing 2002 even if, against your argument, but you can have. A even if you don't, even if you don't buy that, we would say Malawi. Even if you buy that Malawi got worse with the IMF, we would just say that the IMF is active in 80 percent of the other countries, like El Salvador, which you draw. But Catherine, uh, no, I respond to it with the four other country or with the four other agencies that do the exact same thing. Right, for but your the four evidence. other agencies have one fifth of the spending <laughs> power of the IMF. Can take a question. Can I get a question? Into yeah. In so far as you drop the fact that trade liberalization has pulled 140 million people out of poverty, how do you still have solvency on your own case when you say the reason people deforest in the first place is because they need money? No, this is the reason we say that people deforest is because the IMF debts can't be rescued. Right, they need money to pay it back. No, it's specific to the IMF debt, right? That's sure, the they need money. Sure, sure, they need money to pay the IMF debt. Well, we would say that they're like broke in the first place. And if on net, we tell you that okay. people get richer in our world. So are you saying that, that like someone who is poor is now all of a sudden paying the IMF's debt? Oh, we know when people are richer, when that's income inequality goes down, economic growth goes up, right? Because people right, have higher spending sure. power. That Ooh. makes the government more able to pay back all debt. Right. That's Cross the word. All right, it's just going to be, uh, how about extension? It's going to be our C3 starting on their overview and then down the uh, the pro case. Cool, is anyone not ready? Great, then my time will start now. On the overview, they just say that it's true is true because countries go to the IMF, but they drop the response that says that because there's so much money going to these countries, they literally can't refuse it because of political will. That's what Mayhul says. There's no reason why like a country is all of the wang in the entire round. It's ridiculous. But on our C3, they extend a few things. First is carbon tax, but they literally don't extend the link. They don't even tell you if the IMF does carbon tax in summary. So this is just completely dropped. But then they say Burr finds that recessions are going up in a holistic study, but it's not talking about the people that are going into poverty, right? That doesn't actually link into our case. If anything, it's just providing unique voter for them that we respond to anyway. Their link into forgiving debt and things like that is only $1 billion on their side of the flow. There's no reason why that actually means anything. Let's extend case. They clean drop our first warrant from Ferrand that finds that the IMF boosts coal investment, which leads to a lot of air pollution, which is why Tong finds that this air pollution kills 8.7 million people every single year. That's historical and it's the cleanest place to vote because they just drop it. But our second response is the only thing they, res they extend, they respond to, which is that deforestation goes up because countries have to pay back IMF loans because they can't be rescheduled. That's unique to the WRM, WRM evidence, but Batika finds that because the IMF debt can't be rescheduled, deforestation goes up and economic growth goes down, which is why Dibi finds that mismanagement from the IMF in Indonesia, Thailand, and South Korea led to 200 million in poverty. Their first response comes in second summary and says that it's the Asian financial crisis. That's not a response. On their case, First of all, they drop all of our indicts to all of their impacts. They literally don't have anything left in the round except for turns. All of their impacts are terrible. Their 200 million impact has nothing to do with the IMF and COVID impact. On their first warrant, they just say we drop it. No, we extend a few turns first as cash crops because the IMF liberalizes. Other countries come in and they literally take up all the land. They say they have more fertile land. No, that's our response. Then on the point about reform, they say we don't have a response. Yes, we do. Four countries or four other agencies. That's literally their evidence. It's talking about the US aid program. I've read it. But then on net, they go for a liberalization turn. But remember, 200 million always outweighs and lives always outweigh because we have 8.7 million per year. They say we're not looking to the future. Yes, we are. We have like 10 seconds, we'll just take that. Okay.
All right, we good? Yeah. All right. So the order of the speech is pretty much going to be down, uh, let me see. It's going to be our case and then their case. Everyone ready? Start at the top. The IMF specifically funds food production and expand trade, all of which brings prices down. The IMF streamlines taxes to ensure that money is collected from the wealthy and revenue goes into social spending. They've done this for 120 countries already. That's the past tense. But then Virgin Tech tells you that there's better land so they can always do well, which is why deregulation has already helped 140 million people out of poverty and it gives people more market. But then they drop the Castile evidence throughout the entire round, which literally tells you that prices go down, which is why more people can afford food in the developing world. That is uniquely our link. But then we they tell you that our evidence about 200 million is really bad. Again, we responded to this like 10 times. We just say that the IMF is the largest organization it's the only organization that can do this much since the other organizations give it to you for free if they really could ramp up then they would have already ramped up but they need imf money but then we tell you what's really important is that even if you give them 40 40 55 percent like mitigation we're still going to win on magnitude and time frame because they never respond to hepo's weighing which is that lack of food leads to chronic outcomes and that causes generational hunger on time frame that's going to be the largest future impact that you always have to outweigh first but then we let's go to their case right a couple of things on carbon tax we would say that one coal is a carbon tax so i don't really know what they're saying when they're saying that we're not counting that and the IMF has already thought into this they never respond to this at all but what loses their round critically is Burr 20 which tells you that in 25 years IMF involvement reduces income inequality for the 18 percent and closes the gap by 40 percent their small impacts are just temporary because in the long term income inequality is better this means that people are uniquely worse off in their world meaning that they have to rely on cheap forest more deforest more and deforestation in their world automatically gets worse they never respond to this at all but then we would tell you on climate we have long-term solvency because we're the only one that implements the carbon tax which we tell you is the only long way to like do all of this stuff but then we would say that they can see the fact that conditionalities are decreasing 25 percent and they can see the fact that the imf already forgave debt to the 30 poorest countries which means that they don't even have link into their own impact at all insofar as the imf's forgiving debt they don't even need to pay back this debt in the first place but then what they really miss is that governments always need to cut debt in uh, cut fiscal spending in the time of crises which means that if the imf is coming in at least they're giving you money and on net it's always going to be better that's why we've already helped 200 million people and 140 million people out of poverty from food and trade. Good round, y'all. Good round, y'all. Good round. Thank you, everyone, for judging. I know it's early. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for judging, everyone. Yeah, for sure. We'll go <clears throat> fill out our tab room ballot, and then we'll come back and let you know how it went. All right.
All right, everyone, are we back? Can I get everyone back in the room? All right, awesome. Uh, so first of all, I just want to congratulate both teams on making it to Octafinals in the TOC. That is very exciting. Um, all four of you are excellent debaters, so congratulations. Um, the vote is a 2-1 for, for the con, um, and I am the sitter. I am the one who voted pro, so I will start with my RFD. And now I have to find it in tab room really quick. I'm so sorry. Give me one second. Because... Oh, here we go. Okay. Um, so for me, it's pretty simple. Honestly, I just like when I look at the flows, I see pro winning more of them and more consequential flows than the neg, at least for me. Um, I need to read this off my ballot, though. So I think that like the the con has multiple places where like I can easily see why my co-judges voted the way that they did like the con has multiple places that you could have voted but for me they just weren't strong enough like for me the con picking apart the IMF as the actor um the con having these points about cash crops that turn into exports instead of feeding people like I think those are both really good points but then I'm not specifically told why to vote on those instead of the pros so for me like at least or at least the pros weighing was stronger for me um so i'm convinced that the pro garners the more impacts um they've convinced me that the benefits outweigh the harms um i think that the yeah i think uh it's a pretty simple pro ballot on food for me so does anyone have any quick questions for me before we go to the other judges I have a question about the weighing. Um, did yeah. you buy the, like, hastily put together, um, people are in poverty, so, ex like, they don't have to rely on, like, cheap coal and, like, export swing, or was that not really? No, I didn't buy that, no. Okay, gotcha. Sorry. <laughs> it just wasn't quite enough, it wasn't flushed out well enough. I flowed, like, three words of it on my flow, so I knew you had said it, but, like, I didn't, yeah, no. All right, well, All right. that's me. Let me pass it off to my other judges. I have a lot of background noise, so I'm going to make this quick. Um, I think that the cash crops argument, and I also think that the the land grabs type argument, both of those are internal link turns to the AF. So I think that the NEG is very clearly winning both of those turns, and I don't think there's really a response to it. So I don't think the AF generates any offense on their case. Um, that being said, I vote on a risk of offense of the neg case of climate change, of that risking any lives happening, of that risking the 200 million people in poverty as a historical incident. Um, I vote there. I think that the carbon tax response is not warranted or fleshed out enough in this debate. Um, you literally just say coal is under a carbon tax in your final focus. That's your response. Um, that's not fleshed out enough for me. Uh, you have this income inequality decreasing and like GDP de increasing type card from Burr that I think that the AF is probably winning some implication of, but I don't understand why that's a reason to vote AF. That card needs to then be implicated even more in this debate as to why the IMF wouldn't force countries to develop coal plants or why the I like like I, I think that the NEG is winning a really conceded link that the IMF forces countries to develop more coal plants. And then I think that those coal plants directly lead to 8.7 million deaths, which I think is a conceded impact. Um, so I, I pretty much could have voted on either climate impact because I think that they were both conceded risk of offense. All right, and that leaves me. Um, so great round. Um, Obviously, I also voted for Hawk and LB on the negative. Um, first of all, I don't buy the weighing that I should look infinitely into the future to evaluate the IMF. So I evaluate based on what has happened already and kind of what's happening right now. Um, and in this, the negative gives me the air pollution argument to vote on the climate change impact out to 200 million uh, lives, as well as uh, the South Korea at all examples, because I don't remember the other two countries and the turn on Malawi's issues being caused by the IMF. And at this point, what the F has is that the IMF might be trending better and might be wanting to fix kind of these issues from the past. But when I compound all of the evidence that Nick gives me about what the IMF has done and kind of how at this point, the IMF might be trying to fix the problems they've caused when I weigh it on balance. And when I look at 
whether or not the benefits outweigh the harms. Benefits that are fixing the harms that it's already caused don't really outweigh for me. So um, I vote for the NIG. Uh, All right. Thank well, you guys so much. Really fun. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Y'all are going to do great. Bye, everyone. Yeah. All right. Thanks.